have a good Wednesday evening. If you will, take a hymnal and stand with us and turn to page number 563. Sing and count your blessings, page number 563. When the moonlight billows, you were tempest tossed. Church, good to see you tonight. Glad you, uh, glad you chose to be here this evening for our midweek service, finishing up the book of Habakkuk tonight in our Bible studies. Taking us a little while to get there for such a short book, but been a good, uh, it's been a good study. I want to remind you of some things coming up um, the weekend. In the bulletin, it says that tomorrow night is the School of Music. It's not. It's a week from tomorrow night on the 21st. But this weekend, Lord willing, we're going to have this... Uh, we're going to have this Easter egg hunt for the kids. Um, I'm not encouraged by weather forecast, but we can try to pray this, pray the rain out of here Saturday, if you would, work on that. If you're helping us with that that morning, we're going to try to have the workers here at 1030, um, just so we can get a game plan out, um, and then we'll figure out what to do uh, as far as the, the funeral, or the, uh, the egg hunt. I'm, I'm saying that, there's, there's a motive to my madness, I'm saying that because we have a funeral here in the church um, Saturday afternoon at 2. And so uh, our plan was going to be just bring all the kids in here and do it, but I don't know that that's going to fly. So we're going to have to see. We have a funeral in the afternoon. Um, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, so pray. I really need you to pray for that rain not to show up. If it wants to come after 12 on Saturday, that would be perfect. That's fine. Uh, but pray that we're able to have that for the kids, if you would. And then our, our Resurrection Sunday celebration. Um, we'll have our Sunday school hour at 9, but our, our Sunday morning service is going to be all recognizing uh, the celebration of Christ's resurrection. And then Sunday evening, we have our Lord's Supper service. And our, uh, our, our Sunday evening service will be a high worship service for us. And so I hope you're able to, uh, you're able to make that. Let's, uh, let's look for those folks maybe between now and Sunday that you might know that don't go to church, but they'd be open to going to church on, on Easter Sunday. Uh, there are a lot of people. They're good for about two Sundays a year, aren't they? They're good for the Christmas week, and they're good for Easter week. And so please uh, keep, your, uh, keep your radar up, I should say. And there may be those that might accept an invitation to come to church and hear the gospel on Sunday. And I hope, uh, I hope that you're already praying for those that might be in our service that aren't saved. We had a good day yesterday. I wanted to share something with you before Brother Jeff comes back. Um, Terry and I had the opportunity to go with the Peaches 
and uh, the Yinglings and the Christiansons to Johnson City and had a really good meeting with a, uh, with a, a guy named Chris Lapino um, about missionary care. And, and what we were talking about was just how to be better at being a sending church. They did most of the talking. I didn't do much talking at all. I was sitting there just soaking it up, listening to a bunch of missionaries talk about um, sending and supporting churches. And so it was really a profitable meeting. And I want you to continue to pray that our church will be what we ought to be, especially to these six missionaries that are sent from our, from our church. We want to uh, we want to do what we ought to do as far as holding those ropes. We had a great day. Eventually, I'd like to get Brother Chris here to speak to our church. He's got a great heart, um, a great heart for serving missionaries. And um, I, just, I appreciate the way, he, the way he thinks. He's never been a missionary, but he pastored for 39 years and apparently made several trips to the missionaries that they supported. And uh, one of those missionaries now works with him in this missionary care group. And so I, I look forward one day to maybe having him, uh, him come. In just a little bit, we'll, we'll shake hands. We can greet one another tonight. If you did not get the, tonight's prayer bulletin, it's, it's been updated quite a bit. You'll want to have this week's prayer bulletin. And then also uh, get a worksheet. A study sheet for tonight might help you uh, organize your notes a little bit better. Um, and I'll do my best to stay on track with those notes. I always get... Uh, I always get approached after church if I miss a blank or something on your worksheet. I say that I put those blanks in there to keep, help you keep attention, but it doesn't do any good at all for those of you that have a little bit of ADD to you uh, if I skip that blank because the whole thing is messed up from the time I miss a blank and we keep going. So I'll try to stay on track with you tonight. You know, for, for all of the sobriety that is found in the book of Habakkuk and all of the heavy talk about judgment, he ends, he ends that book and the verses we're going to look at tonight with three verses of just praise to God uh, for who he is and what he does, uh, what he does, even in his judgment. And I, I think you'll be encouraged. I hope you will. I hope you'll be encouraged uh, with the ending of this book tonight, uh, especially considering the way the book started out. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, let's stand together. Would you do that with your hymn book? And Brother Jeff will come back and lead us in another song. Page number 404. Page number 404. The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest brain. Just a moment, breathe some, we'll come back and sing in just a moment.
Well, amen. Would you, uh, we'll start with our prayer bulletin tonight, if you'd find that. Um, would like you to be in prayer for our, uh, the executive council meeting next week at Bio. We have one meeting every, uh, every April we get together and this is kind of the steering committee for Baptist International Outreach and several of these guys are traveling in from uh, out of state next week. And so I'm taking advantage of them being here. My good friend Barry Rumsey is one of the men on that, uh, he's one of the men on that council and I've asked him to speak to us next Wednesday night. Uh, and so I, I hope you'll plan on coming. He's a, he's a good preacher. He preaches at the First Baptist Church in Ruskin, Florida. Um, he and his family were here in Lenore City at Community Baptist Church for a number of years. And now they've been down uh, for almost 21 years down in, in Ruskin. And so I look forward to him coming. So we put that there on the front of the bulletin. Pray for he and, and others that will be traveling, uh, traveling in as well. We have the uh, we have not added any names rather to that first column that's inside as far as our list for salvation goes, um, but we'll we'll ask you to keep praying for these folks to come to Christ. Some of them on uh, that list you may find on another list where they're either battling cancer or some type of health issue. But it's important that we pray for them primarily to to be saved. And then we have uh, in that second column we try to keep our church family near the top of that, several in our church dealing with cancer, but we thank the Lord that each of them are, uh, each of them are doing uh, well in their, in their battle with cancer and things um, in their stages, I should say. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Tom. We're thankful for the good report. Oh, it's good to see Gail here tonight. I didn't even see you back there, Gail. So thankful that you're here, but um, to hear what God's done through the surgeons, um, with Brother Tom, please continue praying for him and his recovery. And, uh, and while you're doing that, praise the Lord for answered prayer for him too. That'll be important. Um, we've added a couple names there by request. Stephen Reagan, uh, Susan Lindsay is asking us to pray for him regarding brain cancer. And then um, the Evans are asking us to pray for Diana Houston, who's battling breast cancer. So those are two new names to that list. Some of these other names on here are fairly recent additions as well, but pray for these folks um, as, they, as they, some of them begin their battle with cancer. In the next column, um, sure would appreciate you praying for our brother Rick Kent. For about the last week and a half, he has been, um, he has been having a hard battle with kidney stones, very hard battle. Um, pain's been really intense, keeping him awake. Uh, Tanya did say that he was able to rest some last night, but I really would appreciate you praying for him to, to be able to, to pass these stones. And then in addition to praying for that, he scheduled, um, he scheduled to see his urologist, I believe sometime late next week. Um, it would be great if somebody would call that urologist and cancel an appointment because every day Tanya's calling them to see if they've had a cancellation. So I told Tanya what we would do is we would pray for somebody on that list to not need the doctor anymore so Rick could get in sooner. And then I said, or we'll just pray that Rick could get past this issue so he can cancel his appointment. And so pray one of those ways, but he, for about the last 10 days or so, Rick's really been struggling um, pretty intensely with these kidney stones. So pray for him, if you will. Um, you'll note Roxanne has her surgery as well coming up the end of this month for knee surgery. It's been good to hear from Katie Cook that uh, Larry is improving. He had simultaneously bronchitis and pneumonia, but he's improving. He was here for one of the services on Sunday, which was good to see. He's still struggling with fatigue quite a bit. And so pray for him uh, if you would. And then also we, we put Carol Woodley on there. She's dealing with uh, C. diff and colitis. She was in the hospital for a bit, but she is home now. We thank the Lord for that. Pray for their family as they'll be having the funeral service for her husband, Chris, this coming Saturday down in the Atlanta area. Um, specifically, if you would, pray for her son, Emmanuel, uh, to either come to Christ for salvation or if he's saved, to come back to Christ. But pray for him, if you would. They have another son named Chris as well. I know they'll appreciate, um, they will appreciate you praying um, for them. Um, and then Canon Carroll 
is also listed on here. Um, this is um, this is a former relative of Susan Lindsay, and he's got uh, blood clots in his kidney and a hole in his heart that the doctors are watching and they're dealing with. And so uh, we've added Carol Cannon or Cannon Carroll to that list as well. Please continue to pray for uh, to pray for him and others on this list list that we have added as well. Um, under the recovering from surgery. Bill Beck's surgery last week with kidney stone issues went well, uh, so please be in pr continue praying for him. Gene LeCoulter should be getting some news soon about possibly another surgery, but they want to do uh, some tests on her and scans before they go in again, but she still may have uh, two or three fractures in her back even after this last surgery that she had. So please pray for her if you would. Um, Robert Nichols is on here. This is Angie's husband, and we've been praying for Robert. He had um, gallbladder surgery, and he's had some, uh, he's had a buildup of CO2 in his body since the surgery that has been causing him some severe pain. And so they are working to, uh, they're working with, with Robert on that. Please pray for him. He's had low blood, low blood pressure and a high heart rate yesterday, but that subsided, thankfully. But he needs our prayers. The, you know, you hear a gallbladder surgery, and you and I write that off sometimes as that's a routine surgery. No surgery is routine. There's always a potential for some of these things. And Robert's just having a hard time. So I know Angie will appreciate you uh, praying for praying for them. Brother Nick Iwanowitz had his leg surgery. And I was talking to Daniel a little bit about this yesterday. You know, Nick had a very long battle uh, with covid was in the hospital for months, has been on a trach since last September. They've eased him off of that. Uh, he's already had one surgery to deal with scar tissue around the trach. Hopefully at the end of this month, he'll have his final surgery to get the trach completely taken out. He developed a, what's, what the doctors called COVID toe and um, several of the toes on one of his feet turned black and they thought they were gonna be amputating. But the other day, um, I don't know if they tested it and found out or if he cut his toe by accident, but it started bleeding, and the doctors were kind of surprised at that because they didn't know if there's any circulation there or not. Daniel said his circulation surgery last Friday went well for the large uh, blood vessels in his leg, but the small blood vessels are still pretty constricted, and so he's, he's still not out of the woods yet with that. So please pray for Nick, if you would, and, uh, and his wife, Debbie. I know they will appreciate your prayers. Continue praying for Faye Hicks and uh, for Louise McDaniel, if you would. Um, I appreciate you keeping those two ladies in prayer. And then um, under bereavement, um, some of you may have met Kim Ray, uh, Kim Ray and Jill Beck's mother and father. They've visited with us several times, Randy Williams, Barbara Williams. Uh, Randy died pretty unexpectedly yesterday. Um, they put him in the hospital last week in a behavioral unit for some dementia issues. And sometime within the first 24 or 30 hours of him being in the hospital, he had a stroke, they believe. And he went unconscious and has been unconscious all week. And then yesterday, um, around 12 o'clock noon, uh, Randy passed away. This was pretty unexpected, as I said. So I, I would appreciate you praying for his wife, Barbara. They've been married, I think she said, for... Uh, it's 56, I think 56 years, um, and I know she will appreciate your prayers. And then their daughters, Kim Ray and Jill Beck, uh, pray for them. We're going to be having their service here on Saturday. I'm not going to be doing that. Um, they're going to have a, a, their, their pastor uh, do that, but they needed a facility. But they are going to be receiving friends here from 2 to 3 p.m., and then the service is going to be at 3. And so if you'd like to come by Saturday afternoon and just pay your respects, speak a word to Barbara and Kim, Jill, uh, I know they will appreciate that. That'll be here in the auditorium from 2 to 3 and then the funeral service at 3 o'clock. So pray for, their, uh, pray for their family, if you would. Um, and then these others that are also, they're also uh, grieving the loss of their loved ones. Jerry Murphy... Um, is a friend, uh, the father of a friend of Al Lynn Bettner, and a uh, godly man, and after a pretty long battle, he went home to be with the Lord, uh, I believe over this weekend. So pray for his son Mitch, if you would, 
Mitch Murphy is his son, and I know they'll appreciate that. We have our military personnel listed there. Um, let's keep them in prayer, if you would. Uh, some of them stationed around the world. Most of them uh, are here stateside. So whatever their station of duty is, please pray for them. On the back, we have our missionaries listed. Um, Terry and Barb Childers out of town. They'll be coming home soon. Uh, please pray for their safe return home. And they're asking us to pray for the missionary training school. Usually that's in June. They've moved it to July this year. So pray for that meeting coming up. Uh, Jason and Kate, good to see them here tonight, and their daughter. I'm glad to see Anna here. Um, glad you could be with us, Anna. Um, pray for them, for God's direction. We're thankful for God's provision so far. And then they will be, um, uh, they'll be traveling to some churches, supporting churches soon. So please keep the Christiansons in prayer. Johannes and Kittist, serving the Lord. Um, they're in Zambia. They minister to the deaf. I just remind you, I don't know if we say that often enough, Johannes and Kittis are not Zambian. They are Ethiopian. They are from Ethiopia. They're missionaries to Zambia. Um, and Johannes is actually the son of our missionary in Addis Ababa, uh, Gomaja Tefesi. And so there's a connection all there. So pray for Johannes and Kid, if you would. Amber is in the Philippines, and we just stole those prayer requests today off of her Facebook page. Um, I encourage you, if you're on Facebook, um, make sure you're friends with, with Amber. If you, if you use that social media, she is so encouraged by the contact she's getting from our uh, missionaries. And I want to encourage you, church, um, spread that love around a little bit. Um, Johannes is on Facebook. Burhanu has a page. I think his last post was in 1986 or something like that. He doesn't get on there very often. Uh, but Johannes is on there. In fact, you can, you can follow... Uh, ZNBC on Facebook. It's the Zambian News Network, and you can watch Johannes every once in a while. Uh, he's down in the lower left-hand corner, and you can watch him interpret the news. Um, but, but watch our missionaries and encourage them. Amber's been so blessed by your contact with her. She does use the, uh, the app on your phone, WhatsApp. So does Johannes. So does uh, Burhanu. Uh, and you can contact them. That's a, that's, a neat, that's a neat little app to be able to communicate with them. Keep in mind the time changes. Um, like, for example, with, uh, with Amber, she is ex right now during daylight savings time, she's exactly 12 hours ahead of us. So if it's 7.25 in the evening here, it's 7.25 a.m. Thursday there. Um, Burhanu is seven hours behind us, so... What is that? 125 in the afternoon on Wednesday in Ethiopia? Is that right? He's ahead of us too? Everybody's ahead of us? Never mind then. He's behind. All right. Okay. Don't call Johannes anytime soon then because it's only about, what, 2 o'clock in the morning there? And I think, um, or Johannes is six hours. I think um, Burhanu is seven hours. So everybody's later than we are. I was wrong about that. Um, but I, I just think it's important that we have the opportunity to do that. And it may not seem like much to you, but it sure does to them. Um, so keep in touch, if you would. And then at the bottom, um, well, we have the Yinglings, too. Let me keep going. Uh, John and Nikki serving the Lord over here. John's asking prayer for that meeting we're having next Thursday. Um, we do have a new missionary family coming into Bayo on their way to Zambia, and we thank the Lord for that. Burhanu and Wubit serving the Lord in Ethiopia. Uh, Burhanu is looking at going to South Sudan soon with Pastor Abraham and checking on churches and pastors there, so please keep him in your prayers. At the bottom of the page, um, we're praying for the Life Action Ministry. They're a revival ministry out of Buchanan, Michigan. Life Outreach Center, uh, Center here in town, um, and that's a pretty current, that is a pretty current um, request that um, Ms. Gleason is asking us to join her in prayer with. And then Deb Newsom, our missionary to the Gambia, continues to battle cancer um, up in Michigan, but she is, by way of the Internet, ministering to the Wolof people in the Gambia. And so please continue praying for Deb. And we're grateful to be partnered with her uh, for, for quite a long time. We're thankful for that. On the front of your... On the front of your... Um, Bulletin, would you add some? I, uh, I'd like you to pray for my little nephew. His name is Gavin Campbell. 
Uh, he's about seven years old, and he's battling an ear infection and pneumonia right now. Um, and he's, he's having a pretty tough time, especially with the pain with that ear. So I'd appreciate your prayers for Gavin. Katie Cook, asking us to pray for her granddaughter. Her name is Brittany. And um, last I heard from Katie, Brittany's in the hospital up here at Jeff Memorial. She's having some neurological issues. They're dealing with uh, pain and numbness. And this is a young girl. Um, in fact, I think Brittany's the one getting, uh, she's going to be getting married here pretty soon. But the doctors are trying to figure out what's going on with this young lady. So pray for Brittany, if you would. And, um, and then Tony Merrill. Most, several of you know Tony Merrill that comes to church here. He's asking us to pray for his Aunt Alice. Uh, her husband died. Tony's uncle died. And so if you would pray for Alice Penry, I think is her last name, P-E-N-R-Y. Uh, here's a couple that's been married for over 55 years. And I don't know if uh, Greg and Alice are believers or not. Tony's voicemail really didn't say. But pray for the Penry family, if you would. And then Donna Jones is asking us to pray for a good friend of hers. His name is Dale Hopkins. And Dale is battling several um, different health issues right now. And so pray for him and pray for, if you would, pray for his doctors um, so that they would know how to address all of those, all of those things. Well, before we, before we get to our Habakkuk study, let's pause for prayer. Can we do that? And Brother Wayne Martin, would you, would you lead us in prayer this evening?
Amen. Thank you, Brother Wayne, for leading us in prayer tonight. I'm so thankful God invites us to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us, aren't you? And that's an advantage we ought to take uh, every opportunity we get. Habakkuk chapter number 3. Habakkuk chapter 3. I, I love the way this book ends on a positive note. <clears throat> if you've ever been to a, uh, to a marriage seminar or a marriage retreat, a family retreat, something like that, uh, one of the things that marks almost every couple's retreat um, in marriage is that the last session you have together is always a high note and encouraging thing. Now, at the beginning, they might kick you in the shins all like, well, like we have for the last couple Sunday mornings. I'm telling us what husbands and wives ought to be. And it might be a little uncomfortable, but almost every marriage seminar, every premarital training course I've ever looked at, the last session is always this high note. Well, that's kind of how the book of Habakkuk ends, which almost catches you off guard considering the topic of the book from the very beginning has been judgment. Judgment on the children uh, that live, uh, children of God that live in Judah, and judgment on the people of Babylon. God is just talking about judgment after judgment, and so he, we've gone through this whole book now, and we're coming. And I don't know when we're going to go through it again. Um, I don't know if we'll ever go through the book of Habakkuk again. Um, most likely, if if we come back to the book, or if you hear of a sermon from. This book, it's either going to be from chapter 2 and verse 14, where it talks about the just living by faith, or it'll be this passage of scripture we're going to look at tonight, because they're just two encouraging passages. But I'm glad he ends the way he does on this. I, I think even though the book has some things in it that are hard to hear, I think it's important for pastors to preach the whole word of God. Every book in the Bible, and that includes numbers, and it includes the hard-to-understand books. Every book in the Bible has something to teach us or some reproof to give us or an edification or a correction or an instruction in righteousness. Every book of the Bible is inspired by God. We believe that. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is profitable. It doesn't benefit anyone if a preacher skips those parts of Scripture regarding specific sin or hell or judgment or dying to self. It doesn't, it doesn't help anybody for the preacher to skip that. It doesn't help him because he's going to stand before God one day for his responsibility to preach the whole counsel of God. It doesn't help his hearer because they're not getting the whole truth. Let me, let me use the illustration. Some of you can identify with this, but let me use the, the illustration of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is usually a cocktail. Um, it's usually a cocktail of, of medicines they put together, and, and it's, a terrible, it's a terrible treatment. There's no way around it. Uh, there, there is chemical in there uh, that will make you violently sick. It'll take away your hair. It'll take away... Uh, your immune system, um, the, the, the side effects of chemo, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, they're terrible. Let me ask you, is it compassionate of the doctor if he says to you, now look, I'm going to take, take this particular ingredient out because all it's going to do is make you sick or it's going to make you bald or it's going to make you susceptible to illness. So I, I really do like you. In fact, I love you, so I'm going, to take that, I'm going to take that out. Is he really acting in love if he takes that out of there when that's the ingredient that's going to most check the cancer and most kill the cancer cell? That's not real compassion. And a lot of preachers approach the word of God like that. They're going to take out those things that we deem unpleasant and sometimes hard to hear. Habakkuk was not that preacher. Habakkuk was just straightforward and truthful and honest, and he, he let us know exactly what was coming to the children of Judah and exactly what was coming to the Babylonians when God was done using them as his tool of judgment. A doctor who acts like that and a preacher who acts like that really does more harm than good. And I put on your worksheet, this is just how it is with God's word. We need to hear all of God's word 
uh, all that God's word says to us. And that includes the foreboding message of Habakkuk's prophecy. It's good for us to look at these, these hard passages. You don't find a whole lot of grace in the book of Habakkuk. It's just a little short three-chapter book. There's not a lot of grace there. It is judgment, but we need to hear all of God's word Interesting, isn't it, that Habakkuk begins this prophecy with a complaint to the Lord about the evil that was persisting in Judah. Remember that in chapter, in chapter number 1 and verse 2, he says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou, thou wilt not save. And this is how he starts the book. And God's reply, you remember, his reply was was sobering, but it was completely unexpected because God said, I am doing something. I'm just not doing it within the borders of Judah. I'm working outside. I'm working in the people of Babylon to bring them against you and your people, and it's going to be for hard judgment. They're going to destroy Jerusalem. They're going to destroy the temple, and they're going to take thousands of you as captive. And throughout the rest of the book, God begins opening the understanding of Habakkuk as to how he is going to work. And the result of all that is Habakkuk ends his note on this, or ends his book on this high note of praise. So look at Habakkuk 3, would you, verse number 17? Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds' feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. That hind is a type of deer that is native to this part of the world. So he's talking about, he is going to make my feet like a deer's feet. We'll get to that in just a moment. I'd like to look at this tonight. In fact, I'm, I'm taking the title of our study for the evening from the beginning of verse number 19. The Lord God is my strength. So that's where we're headed this evening. And I'd like to look at how he closes this book after judgment against Judah is prophesied. And, and judgment against Babylon is prophesied. And then you have the beginning of this book. Um, it is a song slash poem written in response by Habakkuk. And he's singing this to the Lord. He ends with this praise. And I, I love verses 18 and 19. It just reminds us of God's grace, even in judgment. We talked about that last week when we talked about in wrath, remember mercy. But here, even here, we see God's grace in this terrible judgment. So let's get into this outline tonight, and we'll, uh, we'll begin by looking at verse number 17. And I'd like you to see there Habakkuk's suffering in God's judgment. Habakkuk's suffering in God's judgment. You'll need to remember, and maybe you already do, that the Babylonians, when they came into Judah, they pretty much practiced a scorched earth policy. They just came and took everything, and what they didn't take, they destroyed. For a 30-mile radius around the city of Jerusalem, they had taken all of the crops, all of the herds, and all of the flocks to feed their particular army. They laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Nothing was allowed in. Nothing was allowed out. They took everything, and there was nothing left. He talks about figs and olives and grapes. They were gone. He talked about their flocks and their herds, either stolen or, or driven off. There was nothing left for Judah. There was a famine in the land, if you will. Israel had been stripped. Judah had been stripped, not just of its beauty, but of its productivity, its bounty, ultimately, the joy of the people. The nation was starving. didn't matter if you lived in the city or the countryside. They had come in, and verse 17 says they had, had taken it all. Their economy was broken. Their landscape was barren. And this does not at all sound like the land that Abraham was promised by God 1,400 years earlier when, when God said, I'm going to take you to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. 
And Habakkuk could look around now, and there was no milk and honey flowing anywhere in the promised land. It had been taken. The land had been, had been devastated. In fact, all they saw as they looked around was defeat and despair and death. Milk and honey, what, where did all that go? Had God, had God gone back on his word? We were given this land, and now the Babylonians are setting up tents, and they're, they're sleeping in our houses, and they're eating our sheep, and they're chewing on our grapes. What in the world had happened here? Did God fail to keep his word? Well, you know the answer to that. It's a resounding no. God had not failed to keep his word. Remember that God had promised incredible blessing to Israel if they obeyed him. But in the very same breath, he also promised devastating judgment if they turned away. That sentence can't be separated. Blessing if you obey, cursing if you disobey. Don't separate and, and harbor on one of those more than the other because they're, they're, they're equal and opposite. They are uh, hand in hand. They have to be left together. Obedience always brings a blessing. Disobedience always brings a curse. Can I remind you of our study in Joshua chapter 8? We just did two or three weeks ago. Do you remember that? Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Mount Ebal, the, the mountain of cursing. Mount Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. If I didn't leave it on this worksheet, you can go back and read that. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 9 through 26. And you'll read about the curses. And Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 through 6, and you'll read about the blessings. God, from, from even before, when they, before they got into Canaan, God was telling them, obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings a curse. Right after, and I found this a little tardy, and I, I, told, I told them this. Right after that uh, message on Ebal and Gerizim, and you, you may have seen this. I didn't see it in the news. Jeff Crow came up to me, and Jeff, Jeff said, did you see that article on, uh, this week? He said, every news outlet pretty much carried it online. And then he sent me a link. And he sent me a link to, uh, to a recent archaeological discovery over in the land of Israel. They found, um, there, well, there was this archaeologist back in the 1980s who had been doing a lot of excavation and digging on Mount Ebal. And we know exactly where Mount Ebal is and Mount Gerizim. We, we know exactly where they are. He'd been digging on Mount Ebal. Back in the 1980s, they kept what he discarded. What this guy from 40 years ago discarded, they kept it. And I thought I was bad at hoarding things. They kept his trash for 40 years. In December 2019, they found a little tablet folded up. It's made out of lead. Did y'all read about this? This is incredible. They, it's folded up, made out of lead. It's folded to two centimeters square or three quarters of an inch square. It's so old and brittle that they couldn't open it up to read it. So they sent this thing. It was found on Mount Ebal. They sent this thing to uh, some laboratory recently in, in uh, I believe, in Tel Aviv. And they're able to read this with the, the instruments that they have. They can read what's on this little, I mean, three quarters of an inch square. They can read what's on this folded up lead tablet. And they found 40 ancient Hebrew characters. And they translated them. Keep this in mind, would you? This was found on Mount Ebal. They translated those characters, and here's what those characters say, translated into English. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Cursed by the God Yahweh. You will die cursed. Cursed, you will surely die. Cursed by Yahweh. Cursed, cursed, cursed. Now, what's interesting is that was found, that cursing, that little tablet of cursing was found on Mount Ebal. And Deuteronomy and Joshua both tell us Mount Ebal was the Mount of Cursing. They've dated this. 
to over 1,400 years before Christ was born. The second thing that's interesting about that, you've, have you seen in your studies, especially in Hebrew, have you seen uh, that transliteration of the word Jehovah where it, it has no consonants in that particular word? It is a Y-W-H-W. And that four-letter uh, conglomeration translates to Yahweh, but no consonants. This is the earliest what they found recently is the earliest use in written form of that name of Jehovah. I don't need, let me just tell you, I don't need archaeological, scientific, or historical data to validate something that I find in Scripture. But I love it when God allows the lost world to find things that take away their argument that this is somehow mythological. For a long time, the nation of the Hittite was doubted it ever existed for thousands of years. They were like, the Bible's wrong. There's no Hittite nation ever. We didn't find evidence of it. When they finally did discover it about 100 or 150 years ago, they found that at one time, the Hittites were the ruling empire. And when they found it, there was a massive amount of archaeological evidence that they're, huh, was a group of people called the Hittites. I could have saved them the time and stress and loss of sleep just telling them to read the Bible and believe what they read. God had told them a long time ago on Mount Ebal, and apparently somebody was taking notes on a little lead tablet. And he said, if you obey me, I'll bless you like you can't believe. But if you disobey me, I'll chasten you like you can't believe. Isn't it interesting that a God of such great blessing is also the God of great judgment? Same God, but holy and just in, in every way. Their future, Judah's future, would either be one of blessing or cursing. When they stood there at, at Gerizim and Ebal and Joshua and the Levites down there in the valley of Shechem and, and, and those cursings and blessings are being read and this side is saying amen and this side is saying amen. When all of that's going on, their future was going to be one of blessing or cursing. It was a very clear, stark choice. Blessing or cursing. Life or death. They chose disobedience. They didn't trip into sin. They didn't fall into it. They shows disobedience and the book of Habakkuk is the record of that choice everything that you and I read in these three short chapters is because of the choice Judah made they chose disobedience my point in all of this is that Habakkuk God's holy prophet this faithful man of God he suffered right along with the rest of the children of God. He was right in the middle of that famine. He didn't have any grapes in his cabinet. And he didn't have any goats in his stall. He was right there with them. So was Daniel. So were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know, these, we know these guys were godly. We know they stood in their convictions. They were men of character. We know all of those things. Pure men and yet carried off his slaves and going to bed hungry. They suffered right along with them. Righteous people suffered in Israel because of Achan's sin. Remember that? And the Bible, the Bible tells us this again and again and again. The blessings of the righteous may overflow to the unrighteous. Jesus said in Matthew chapter uh, 5, that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Remember that? Sun, the sun comes up and it, it works on the garden of the, the unjust as much as it does the just. You have, um, you have Joseph, this godly man, living in Potiphar's house. And the Bible says because Joseph was there, Potiphar's house was blessed. So the blessing of the righteous can overflow and impact the unrighteous. But I'll say the same thing. The cursing that falls on the wicked may overflow and it will impact and does impact the righteous. Habakkuk suffered just like, just like the rest of them did, and other godly people. So when the scripture says that figs and grapes and olives and flocks and herds were not found in Judah, all of those things could be said of Habakkuk's home as well. I do believe with all my heart that the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation rapture 
of believers. I believe that before the seven-year period, I'm not a mid-trib guy. I am a pre-trib rapture. I've not been appointed to wrath, the Bible says. So I believe that before the great seven-year tribulation period begins, God is going to rapture his church out of this earth. But that does not mean that I will escape some of God's judgment that is coming and may already be here in the United States of America, nor will you. The judgment of the wicked sometimes overflows to the righteous, just like the blessing of the righteous sometimes overflows to the wicked. So Habakkuk is here, and Habakkuk, this this godly prophet, he's going to suffer some of God's judgment. That's the first thing I want you to see. That's in verse number 17. This famine that's described has come, come home to roost with him. The second thing in verse number 18 is this. Habakkuk's rejoicing for God's control. He's just told us it is not going well here in the land of Judah in verse 17. But he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let's stop there. Habakkuk's rejoicing for God's control. That's an incredible statement. He's remaining joyful because he serves a a faithful God. His joy wasn't built on full crops and fat herds. Habakkuk's joy was not dependent on any change of circumstance. When things got better, he didn't have more joy. When they got worse, he didn't have less joy. His joy was in the Lord. It was not in environment. It was not in circumstance. Think Think about where he's at. There's famine all over the land of Judah. These invading marauders are going everywhere stealing possessions. His cupboards are bare in the kitchen. There's the threat. He doesn't know if he's going to get carried off or not uh, in Babylonian exile. Now, the Babylonians, uh, they didn't complete their exile of everyone for about another five or six decades. But he didn't know that. This threat, was he was living right underneath this threat. But he was not despondent. The Bible says not only was he not despondent, it goes this far. He's rejoicing. He said, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. How do you explain that? Because his joy was in the Lord. So what did he base his joy on? He based his joy on the same thing that you and I are to base our joy on. And I wrote down a couple of them. First of all, he rejoiced in the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord. Genesis chapter 3, God talked about the seed of the woman that was going to bruise the the head of the serpent. There's that that promise of the Messiah that, that was to come. Through this one, the whole world was going to be blessed. David's greater son was going to reign forever. He knew about all of this. Through Isaiah, a prophet who had who had prophesied before Habakkuk. The Lord had said his his anointed would appear, a virgin would conceive, would bring forth Messiah. His name would be Emmanuel, God with us. This one that was coming was going to be like no one before him and no one after him. God himself had promised that and Habakkuk rejoiced in that fact. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He rejoiced in the promise of this Messiah that was to come. Don't think for a moment that he didn't know about Isaiah. Don't think for a moment that Habakkuk didn't know those psalms, especially those messianic psalms. Surely he knew what the Torah said about that one that would bruise the serpent's head. He knew these things. He rejoiced in the coming Lord. He rejoiced, second, in the sacrificial death of the Lord. The sacrificial death of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 53 said that this coming Messiah, Isaiah 53 describes him like this. He will also be a man of sorrows. Remember that? That's a unique phrase to give someone who's supposed to be king of kings and the Messiah for the Jews. And yet the Bible said he's going to be a man of sorrows. Habakkuk knew that those lambs that he had watched his whole life being slain at the temple... He knew that those lambs were simply types of the Lamb of God that would come to take away not only the sin of Israel, but the sin of the, of the whole world. In Acts chapter 8, verses 26, and then the rest of that story, it's that great story about that Ethiopian eunuch, financial secretary, whatever he was, some kind of treasurer, 
uh, for Queen Candace down in Ethiopia. He had come to Jerusalem, apparently had either, he had either previously been introduced to Jehovah or he found out about the true God while in Jerusalem. And he'd come away, I guess if you're high up in politics you could do that, but he'd come away with a, a valuable copy of the Old Testament scrolls. Somehow he'd acquired at least what has come, we've come to know as Isaiah chapter 53. I don't know how he got it. I mean, those things were hard to come by. Keep in mind, if you had a copy of the scrolls, you were holding something that had been handwritten out by scribes who every time they came to the holy name of God would go through this entire uh, cleansing ritual. If you had a copy of the Bible, you had a fantastic treasure. That's still true today. He came away with a copy of at least Isaiah chapter 53. So you have this Ethiopian, and the Bible says that he's, he's, reading, um, he's reading this passage of Scripture from it. And um, miraculously, God brings this Christian disciple named Philip. He brings him right to this guy, out in the middle of the desert, out in the middle of nowhere. God brings him to him. Remember that story? Great, great story. And he runs up, and he jumps in this guy's chariot. Now, if you did that today, somebody think you're carjacking him. You're liable to get shot. But he just runs up and jumps in this guy's chariot. God says, go join yourself to that chariot. He did. Jumped right in. And Philip just gets the ball rolling, doesn't he? Understandest thou what thou readest? And he doesn't even, he, I, I love the way the scripture records this. And maybe there was other conversation. But the Ethiopian doesn't even bat an eye. Like, who are you and where would you come from and why are you in my chariot? He didn't ask any of those questions. Philip said, you understand what you're reading? And, and this was his reply, how can I except some man show me? And Isaiah began describing what Isaiah, or, or Philip rather, began describing what Isaiah 53 was talking about. He pointed that man to the Lord Jesus Christ. This one who is suffering. This one who is being led instead of leading who is willingly going to die. Philip points him to Jesus Christ. I, Isaiah 53, 6 said that this suffering servant was going to be put to death, but not put to death for his own sins. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm the one that went astray. I sought my own way, but God's going to penalize Jesus. That did not compute with that Ethiopian. That didn't make sense to him at all. Philip interpreted that Old Testament passage of Scripture as pertaining to Jesus Christ, and, and rightly so. One of our reasons for rejoicing is because of Christ's death, which ironically probably took place today. There, I'll open up that little can of worms. You can deal with that. I believe Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. Jesus... Jesus was Isaiah's topic. And when Jesus was born and lived, and especially when he died, he completely and perfectly fulfilled that prophecy back in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm saying all that to say Habakkuk knew Isaiah. He believed in that man of sorrows. He not only believed that Messiah was coming, he also rejoiced in the sacrificial death of the Lord. All of those symbols and signs that he'd watched and knew from the tabernacle and the, and the temple, he knew all those things. He knew they were pointing to this one that was one day coming to die for him. I had a great conversation with, a, with an officer the other day, and we were talking uh, about how Old Testament people, and this this particular guy didn't uh I, I don't know if he's a christian but he want he knew how to be a christian which isn't that a dangerous place to be in to know how to be saved but not accept christ he said how how did those old testament people know about jesus how, how did they know about him dying because he hadn't even been born yet so we talked about Isaiah chapter 53 i said they had the prophecies that looked forward to christ's coming and christ dying and I said, they get saved the same way we do. We just look at Calvary from two different sides. They look forward, we look back, but everybody goes to heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. 
So even Habakkuk rejoiced in the coming of the Lord. He rejoiced in the sacrificial death of the Lord. And the last thing is he rejoiced in the sovereign control of the Lord. That is not hard to see at all because when you read verse number 17, in my mind, Habakkuk ought to be devastated. He ought to be worried. He ought to be fretting. He ought to be scared when you read verse 17. But he's not. He says in verse number 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Crops are dead or gone. Flocks have been stolen or run off. But Habakkuk rejoiced that God was in control of all things. Why? He rejoiced in the sovereign control of the Lord. He was at peace because the Lord was his shepherd. So he wasn't going to want. Well, my cupboard's bare. God will take care of that. God will supply all my needs. That's what, he's, that's what he's thinking to himself. He knows what you and I should know, and that's that God controls everything that happens in the universe. If there is a solar flare on the sun, God caused it. If there is a sparrow that falls to the earth, Jesus said, God knows about that little sparrow. Every birth, every death, All of these things are in the mind of Christ. He is in charge. May I tell you that there's no other source of peace or comfort that effectively answers the injustices, the atrocities, the sufferings, and the tribulation, as does the sovereignty of God. When I look at what happened in New York City yesterday, I have to fall back on, by him all things consist. When I look at what's going on in the Ukraine, I have to fall back on he raises up kings and he takes down nations. He's guiding this world in ways and on schedules that we don't understand, but you can be assured and I can be assured he is bringing this world to an appointed and predetermined destination. This thing is working its way up to an apex at some point. History is going to come to a conclusion. God is working this way. So as a result of that, we need to remember some things. Remember that when things are most chaotic, Jesus is still in control. When your prayer seems unanswered, our God reigns. That's what scripture says. The Lord reigneth. And when evil seems to be unchecked, You and I need to know that the king of kings is still on his throne. What what is our comfort in this? That God's in control. If that's not true, let, let me say this. If God's not in control, then that means he can lose control of anything. He's either he's either sovereign. He's either sitting on that throne. Or he's not. Habakkuk looked around at bare cupboards and empty barns. He saw Babylon building and building and building. And they're they're going to be a threat. And yet he says, I rejoice. Why is that? Because even in everything I'm seeing around me, and it looks tragic and it looks terrible and it looks unfair and unjust, I know God's in control. How many times, Brother Wayne has mentioned this, how many times do we hear in, our, in the back of our minds Brother Andy Bonikowski standing in this pulpit, our missionary Spain, saying God is at work even when it appears that he is not. That's what Habakkuk learned in this. He thought God wasn't at work. He said, I am at work. I'm at work in Babylon right now, bringing them to you. When, uh, so, so that leads us to this, and I put this on your worksheet. Whatever tool he chooses to make us more like Jesus Christ, Be confident that he is, in fact, in control. Christ's likeness is the end of our lives. His desire is to finish, to perfectly make me like Jesus Christ. And to accomplish that, he will send in my earthly life, he'll send whatever he needs to. He'll use whatever he can, whatever he deems best. Did I leave that little John Newton quote? John Newton, Amazing Grace writer I love that everything is needful that he sends nothing is needful that he withholds isn't that good don't you with don't you wish Eve would have had that when Satan came and said 
God's holding out on you. Someone should have been on the other side of Eve saying, nothing is needful that he withholds. If God told you you don't need to take that fruit off that particular tree, it's not needful for you. Everything is needful that he sends. Nothing is needful that he withholds. Rejoicing in the Lord means trusting that even in the worst of times and the best of times, our Savior lives and reigns, and he's in control of everything that's going on. This is where Habakkuk comes. Why can he say verse 18 after verse 17? Because he believes even in this, even in the hardest time in his life, even in the face of great loss or great threat, God's still in control. There's the suffering in God's judgment. There's rejoicing for God's control. The last thing I want you to see, Habakkuk's conviction of God's keeping. And that's in verse number 19. Aren't you glad that God keeps you? Keeps you safe? Keeps you on the right road? Gives you the right direction? Verse number 19, he says, The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet or like a deer's feet. He will make me to walk upon mine high places. There's one thing, I and mean, there's a bunch of things to learn from this, but one of the things that strike me in this particular book is how personal Habakkuk's relationship is to God. You, you think about how personal this is to God. He's complaining to God. He's suggesting alternative plans to God. I mean, when's the last time you did that? You can do that if your relationship is personal with him. He's, he's pretty big God, big shoulders. He's got, this, he's got this very personal relationship with God, and they just go back and forth. Well, like, like God said about Abraham, I, I talked to him face to face. It's like, he's my friend. He said that about Moses. Talked to him face to face. He called Abraham his friend. And Jesus said, you and I are his friends. Personal relationship. That personal relationship, I, I know, notice what it, what it came for. That's the reason for Habakkuk's security. That personal relationship. This wasn't some standoffish God. Notice first, the reason for Habakkuk's, secure, Habakkuk's security is the first part of verse number 19. The Lord God, literally that, that phrase is the sovereign Jehovah. The Lord God is my strength. Man, that changed him from, that idea changed him from the inside out that this God was personal to him. He was strengthened with new resources, new desires, new purpose, new focus in life. He started out in, at the beginning of this book. Did he not out, start out looking this way and by the end of the book, that whole perspective has changed, hasn't it? God, why aren't you doing anything? Lord, I praise you for actually what you are doing. New focus on life. You know that the New Testament echoes that same idea, that same thought? It, it talks about you being born again. That's a pretty big change. It talks about you and I being a new creature in Christ Jesus, uh, Christ Jesus, or that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, transformed from the inside out. The reason for Habakkuk's security, because the Lord God is his strength. There was something in him. You have the indwelling, as a Christian, if you're saved, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit in you that enables you to live like a child of God. You live in a sin-cursed world, and you walk around in a sin-cursed body, but the Holy Spirit enables us to be children that look and walk and talk like him. I, I left this on your worksheet, too. God supplies all our needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That is not limited to material needs. That is not limited to material needs. All... When we go to Philippians chapter 4, a lot of times with that particular verse, we think, well, if I give this offering, God's going to take care of my needs. He's going to put food in my cabinet. And that's certainly what Habakkuk needed. His grapes, figs, and olives were all gone. Goats and sheep, non-existent. He needed those material things. But can I tell you, that's not limited to material needs. Your God also, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, he'll meet all your spiritual needs. He'll meet all your emotional needs. 
he does this. When, when Habakkuk experienced great temptation, he found strength in God to resist that. He went back to God repeatedly in this book. Why, why could he do that? How could he do that? Because God's resources are inexhaustible. You can go again and again and again. We, we sing that song with the choir. That little song that starts out with all those do 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 do. You keep going back to the well of grace. How, how do you do that? It's inexhaustible. It doesn't matter. And that's what Habakkuk found. Scripture teaches we believe that the same spirit that raised up Christ now indwells us. And there's not a greater power that exists in the world than the Holy Spirit of God. When you ask a Christian why they live for the things of God that are yet unseen, to use a, a Bible phrase, and, and it seems like to this Christian that things that he's never seen are more important to him than the things that he can see and he, he can touch. And you say, why, why are your priorities like that? Oftentimes they'll say something like this, because the Spirit of God lives in me. And I'm loved with a love that will not let me go. I'm secure in him. He's going to take me home. It's impossible for me to fall out of his hand. Regardless of what happens in this world, I'm in him. He's in me. The reason for his, the, the reason for his security was it wasn't that he was such a great guy. It's that he served such a great God. That was what held him close. He looked all around, everything around him falling apart. But I will rejoice. I will rejoice, he said, in the Lord. The Lord God is my strength. That's the reason for his security. The last part of the verse is the result of his security. What's going to happen because you're, because you're held by God like that? And he's going to keep you even in the face of all this danger that's threatening you and this lack that you have, Habakkuk. What's, what's going to happen with you? He says, he'll make my feet like hind's feet and he'll make me to walk upon mine high places. He's talking about the sure-footedness of a deer in the woods. A white-tailed buck and I can walk across the same exact terrain. And I will go at a much slower and more cautious speed than that white-tailed buck. I'm just trying to keep upright. I'm grabbing trees and grabbing limbs. I'm doing everything I can not to fall down on my seat and slide down this hill. Meanwhile, that white-tailed buck, he's going up the side of the hill like he's walking across flat ground. You ever seen those, uh, you ever seen those animals over there in Asia, those, those deer-like creatures? Um, and they've, they've got those great big horns. They're not that big of an animal. They're just a little bitty deer, you know, about this tall. But they've got these great big curved horns. You seen those? They're walking parallel on what looks like a vertical cliff. And you're like, how in the world is that thing walking where he's walking? You're looking at that and you're trying to find a ledge or something. There's no ledge. He's, he's got these feet that are made to grab. All, they're not suction cups, but they grab almost like a suction cup. And on a, on a wall that's got, that's got an angle like that, He'll just run down that thing like, like nothing. He'll run down that. How does he do that? That's the way God enabled him to do that. That's the way God made him. Now, the evolutionists say, well, that's how he evolved. No, that's exactly what's being talked about in verse number 19. He will make my feet like a hind's feet. He gives me a sure-footedness as I walk through this life. Satan's going to throw stumbling blocks at you, but God will keep you from tripping. He'll be faithful to keep your footing sure. How's that? In obedience. You walk in obedience. There's a guy named Walter Shantry, and he wrote a, an article in one of the Banner of Truth magazines. And the, uh, the article was called Habakkuk, a book for times in extreme crisis. That was the name of this, this thing. And he said, the high places mentioned there in verse number 19, he said that's a reference to the person who's a victor. He said when battles took place in mountainous areas back in Habakkuk's day or in the Old Testament times, when battle took, pla took place and, and they would fight these down in the valleys, he said the victors would often go to the surrounding mountains and they'd walk those ridge lines where they could be seen and it's the equivalent of a guy taking a victory lap at NASCAR. When you win it, you, you just 
go around the whole thing, let everybody know I won this. And that's what he's talking about here. He'll, he'll make me take a, a victory lap. But everything around you, Habakkuk, is collapsed and falling apart. But, but, but God's going to keep your footing sure. He's going to give you the victory, and he's going to give you this, he's going to give you this victory lap. So when we come to those sections of our journey in this life where dangers are lurking and trials are waiting and things seem lost, how are we going to survive? That trial looks too heavy. This test is too hard. This loss is too great. Are you stuck to carry that by yourself? Absolutely not. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon mine high places where I win, where he's made me victorious. That is a fantastic finish to a book that started with, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? And now he's praising God for being the joy of his salvation. He was perplexed. Remember the, remember the, the very title of our, our series is Habakkuk the Puzzled Prophet. He starts out perplexed, but he went to God and he poured out his complaint. And God's answer eventually brought him peace. Now, initially, not so much, did it? Because he has that back and forth with God. But eventually, God brings around his way of thinking so that he ends up saying, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord God. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places. This is what he does. That's great assurance. You, you are looking at, at Habakkuk's faith in full bloom. This is the guy who told us earlier, the just is going to live by faith. He's proving it. He has no reason, and some of you have no reason when you look around to think this is going to work out. Some of you are looking around, you're saying, this is an utter collapse. That's where Habakkuk's at. We've got no food, we've got no defense, our government is collapsing. Habakkuk had no reason to look around his life and have any hope at all. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That is faith in full bloom. It's easy for me. When my bank, ha- when my bank account has a few thousand dollars extra in it, and we're looking for place to store the extra canned goods, and my lawnmower's not in the repair shop, it's easy for me at those times to say, look, I'm just walking by faith. But when none of those things are true, that's where your faith can bloom. Habakkuk's did. I think Habakkuk 3, 17, 18, 19 sound a lot like Philippians 2.17 because he's saying here in verse 17, boy, it's all bad, but I'm going to rejoice in God. The Lord is my strength. Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says, Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. If it comes down to where they kill me, I'm rejoicing. Doesn't that sound like Habakkuk chapter 3? This is exactly how it went. So here's our closing thought. Habakkuk has brought man's plight into the context of God's power. He has brought man's plight into the context of God's power, leaving no room for discouragement, just utter trust and confidence. And what I'm saying to you, what I'm suggesting to you is you are are maybe in a plight. Bring it into the context of God's power. I don't know how this is going to work out. This financial crisis my family and I are facing, Pastor, I'm just telling you, it's a wreck. This this, uh, time in our marriage or this time in our family or this decision I have to make about my job, I I just just don't know how we're going to do this. I I just don't know. I, I don't see how this could work out. Habakkuk was sitting in your chair. He is right next to you, and he's saying to you, the cabinet may be bare, the stall may be empty, but you need to rejoice in God. He is your strength. Terrible prophecies, terrible predictions about what's going on, but he leaves us on such a high note saying, whatever's going on, I know God's in complete control, and I know I am secure in him. 
And then Habakkuk walks off the pages of the scripture. And the only time you're ever going to hear from him again is when he's quoted in the New Testament, the just shall live by faith. That's all you know about Habakkuk. Isn't that a wonderful way to walk out of this world? Go like that. When it comes your time to go, go like that. God enables you to speak right before you die. Tell people, I am trusting in the Lord. He is my strength. Let that be the last thing you say, and then let God take you home. That's the way to go. Lord, thank you for Habakkuk. We could get, we could get very down by looking at the circumstances maybe in our uh, home or in our country or in this world, and whatever those circumstances might be. The devastation is there and the despair is there and the defeat is there and the enemy looks huge and the cost looks high. Help us to remember that you, Lord, are our strength. Help our confidence to be in you. You give beauty for ashes. You give strength for weakness. And you told us if we'll obey you and follow you, follow your ways, you would give us life and blessing that we can't imagine. Help us to heed the warning that goes the other way and help us to choose life. We pray in your name. Amen. God bless you, church.